Thank you. Um, can I just get a quick show of hands in the room? Who, who here is in leadership or a founder of a startup? Who here are the people that we need every day to keep our businesses going? Um, who here has aspirations to be in the startup world? So pretty much nobody put their hand up. Um, <laughs> My name is Najid. It's a pleasure to be here today. I'm representing a, a, a startup in Vancouver called Kila. I have no idea what my slides say, so I'll find out. Um, they don't, apparently. Oh, there we go. Um, I want to talk today a couple of lessons about um, how startups can change you and how they force you to put your ego in a little box and keep it locked up. Um, I don't need to talk about me because I was given a very embarrassing introduction. Uh, I am a recovering lawyer. Uh, I'm very grateful that I have some time, I've had some time to practice law uh, because it taught me a lot about myself and about the work that I do. Um, okay, so I work at a company called Kila where we help nonprofits do good better. We're a platform for nonprofit organizations around the world to uh, help organizations work more effectively. I don't want to talk about my business. What I want to do is tell you a story. Um, I don't care about any of this. Um, so this is how it is to be in a startup. This is a curve of your emotional well-being. <laughs> um, and I want to tell you a story that exemplifies this. On Tuesday or Wednesday of last week, I'm not good at days, um, my office lit on fire. <laughs> so three months ago, we got our office, it was amazing. We have an office. We went from not having an office to having an office. And then it caught on fire. Thankfully it didn't burn down. But we were, one of our developers, God bless him, put a muffin in the microwave. He forgot to take the paper out. <laughs> um, in about two minutes, the whole room was filled with yellow and black smoke. We were on a, someone was on a sales call. The server was being updated with the newest version of our software. And there was a fire. <laughs> so what did I do? What was going through my mind? That's what I want to share with you guys. My first thought, <laughs> believe it or not, was let's not screw this sales call up. <laughs> my second thought was I need to keep my staff safe. These are my family. These are the people who give me and our company everything in their entire lives. My third thought was we can't afford an insurance premium hike. <laughs> my fourth thought was take a deep breath, relax. My fifth thought was you can't take a deep breath, there's toxic smoke in the air. <laughs> my final thought was let's get Ellen, who was on the sales call, out of the room and not interrupt that call and make sure that we don't interrupt our day. Now why am I telling that story? Because firstly, um, if I had an ego, that story burned it. Right, literally. If I thought that I had any amount of control of anything I do beyond what I actually do, I was wrong. The being in a startup, running a business, an early stage business, being controlled by your investors, um, is anything but ego driven. And in order for anybody, and I've heard lots of smarter people than I speak, to see success in your startup, you've got to mitigate your ego. You've got to mitigate your ego to your investors and your shareholders, you've got to mitigate your ego to your staff and your clients, but, you know, but mostly you gotta mitigate your ego to the market, because that's gonna determine whether you're successful or you're not. And I think as a lawyer, and you know, not that we have big egos, but it's important to, uh, you learn pretty quickly that this is something that it's probably one of the best lessons that I was ever taught. And I was taught it by my office ca ca catching on fire, and I was caught it by amazing mentors. The second thing was your job as a, as, in a, as a leader of a young startup, or actually any company, was is find the smartest, most brilliant, passionate, graceful human beings in the world and make them your team and make them your family. Because I wouldn't be standing here, our company wouldn't serve hundreds of nonprofits all around the world, but for those amazing young women and men. Actually, not that young anymore, which is fantastic. Um, so I owe it to them and anyone in this room who's in leadership from, Daniel will tell you the same thing, anyone here will tell you the same thing and that's your team is is your fundamental. And my third thing is probably the least sexy sentence in the world, and that's trust the power of data. Instinct is really, really important, but data-driven decisions are something that are, are, are so important even when they aren't what you want. Most of the time, men, if, you know, maybe not most if you're doing well, but too often the data is gonna tell you something different from A, what you're doing, or B, what you wanna see. 
and that it's so important that you listen to that data, but don't just do what the data says. The data informs your decisions. So let it inform those decisions. Trust your team and curb your ego, and you'll be just fine. Thanks. This thing's awful. Here we go. Thank you. Um, so in your opinion, what's the first thing Travis Kalanick needs to do? I have, oh. I have no idea who Travis Kalanick is. He's the head of, he's the head of Uber. Oh, who's it's a great question. A few problems talking to his staff and people who work for his company. So I think the first thing, and that underlines if you find you know, brilliant, hardworking people, is it doesn't matter how good they are, your job is to respect them. And that goes to point one about mitigating your ego, right? Any CEO whose ego get out, gets out of hand is going to find problems. The customers are gonna complain. Your staff are gonna leave you. And so I think humility, I don't know how he's gonna find it, but he's gotta find it. And you see CEOs all around the world uh, who run into this problem. And I think uh, he is an example because he's such a public example, but the reality is th there are too many CEOs, women and men who think they know the answers to the questions. What they should be learning is how to ask the right questions because their teams, their mentors, and their clients are gonna answer it. So I think if he can find some respect and he can find some dignity, he can put that ego back in that little box, I think it'll, it'll go a long way. And I think that starts with an apology. Any other questions? Oh, fantastic. So I love the point of view. Through that lens though, how do you explain the success of Donald Trump? <laughs> um, this very, poor man. <laughs> very much off the record. Here's what I'll tell you. People will believe a story if it's compelling. So in all of our businesses, this is the pivot by the way. In all of our businesses, if we learn our audience, our clients, our shareholders, whatever it is, and tell them a compelling story, you can win. Whether it's from an election, or whether it's a client for, you know, for any of us today. So the power and the importance and the impact and the influence of storytelling is more fundamental than we can all imagine. But it's important to understand why that is. And, and rooted in that, and it actually goes to your point about the CEO of Uber, and that's in empathy. Now, it might not be empathy that some of us like, but if he can, right, in the case of people, politicians who we disagree with, but if you can strike that empathetic chord with the people you're talking to, your stakeholders, then you are gonna be able to exert an incredible amount of influence. And my hope, Dan's hope, all of our hopes is that you do good things with, those influence, with that influence. And that's all I'm gonna say on that. No, no, it's okay. Any other questions? Oh, last one. It comes down to mathematically K cubed. Know yourself, know your audience. I cannot possibly disagree with that. <laughs> Thank you all for your time. Thanks, Najid. That was amazing. Thank you.